Lord Jesus, you are our only hope, the only rock, the only solution to our sin, the only way that we could have a citizenship in heaven. We thank you for your death in our place. We come now to your word and ask that you would be revealed in it, that your Holy Spirit's penning of these words would have impact on our own lives. May we think your thoughts after you. May we be overwhelmed by the gracious nature that you display, that you are a God full of compassion and mercy and relentless kindness. May we see these things on display in your word this morning by your power and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles once again to Romans chapter 10. We'll be, Lord willing, finishing Romans 10 this morning. You've just won the lottery, and you've been instructed to come down to the lottery office to pick up the check. Now, let's assume for the sake of this illustration for a moment that winning the lottery actually would be a good thing. I'm convinced that it may be about the worst thing that could ever happen to you, but just for the sake of illustration. You've won the lottery. You simply need to come down and pick up the check. Would you disobey that good news? Would you disobey that good news? Come down to the office and pick up the check. As we looked at last week in Romans 10, 16, that is exactly what Israel has done, disobeyed the good news. However, they did not all heed the good news, Paul says, of Israel. They did not heed it. They did not obey the good news. We don't often think of obedience in terms of receiving a free gift, and yet it is exactly what is commanded here. We need to be asking the question, why did Israel fail to believe their own Messiah? Why did Israel fail to believe their own Messiah? That is the question that Paul poses for us in Romans 10, 18 to 21 this morning. Let's read these four verses together. But I say, surely they've never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone to the ends of the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. What we have here in the span of four verses are four Old Testament quotations bolstering the reality that Israel is culpable for her unbelief in Messiah. This is not an innocent ignorance. They cannot claim, I didn't know. They cannot claim, I've never heard. In fact, when we looked at last week, this chain of events that happens in gospel proclamation, Romans 10, 14, after Paul says, whoever will call in the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved, how will they call in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're sent? And the reality is God has sent and commissioned proclaimers and proclaimers have proclaimed and Israel has heard and Israel has not believed. And so they have not called on Messiah and so they have not been saved. That is the situation of Israel in Paul's day. And we see Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, leaking his love for his countrymen. You know that everywhere Paul went, commissioned by Jesus to take the gospel to nations and tribes and tongues outside of Israel, the Gentiles, most of us, that Paul went to the synagogues first in every city he went to and preached to his countrymen because he loved them, even though commissioned to take the good news of Jesus the Messiah everywhere else, he couldn't help but preach the gospel to his compatriots. 
And why did they not believe? Well, let's back up in Romans 10 together our context a little bit. In verse 11, Paul says, the scripture says, whoever believed in him will not be disappointed. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now look down at verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word about Christ. And so Paul follows up these remarkable statements with verse 18. And verse 18 introduces something of an excuse. But they haven't heard. What is it they haven't heard? In this context, they haven't heard the word about Christ. At least that's the excuse that's put forward. Paul immediately, emphatically refutes that argument shuts down the excuse by saying, indeed, they have heard. And we often think this way. Maybe someone just hasn't had the opportunity, and so they're off the hook. That cannot be said of Israel. And Paul here quotes Psalm 19, verse 4. We read this last Sunday, Psalm 19. You know it is this great psalm about God's self-disclosure the way God reveals himself. And he reveals himself in two significant ways. One is what we call general revelation, that is God's revelation in nature. And the second way is special revelation or God communicating personally, face-to-face or in his word, either the incarnate word, Jesus Christ, or the written word as it's portrayed in Psalm 19. And these two categories of revelation bear some similarities, but they are significantly different. In fact, I want you to turn to Psalm 19 because I want us to see what Paul is doing by quoting Psalm 19 here in Romans 10 to emphasize the indictment against Israel's unbelief. Paul quotes Psalm 19.4. And in the Greek text and then in Romans 10, He quotes it this way, their clear sound has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the inhabited world. Psalm 19 is broken down into three sections. It's a remarkable song written by David and the subject is the revelation of God. First, general revelation, then natural revelation. I mean, then special revelation. Verses one to six, the heavens are literally screaming out the glory of God. That is the vast universe around us and the intricate details of the microcosms at our feet. They all shout out the the beauty and the glory and the transcendent wisdom of God. And this witness to God's creative power, to his genius, are evident to every human who has ever walked the earth at all times. This is a message that is always going forth. It is a message that is always heard. It is always seen. That is the message of the first six verses of Psalm 19. Verses 7 to 9 pick up special revelation or the written word of God. And and there you get these descriptions. The law of Yahweh is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. Uh, A series of parallel descriptions of the word of God and its effects... And then verses 10 to 14 is the residual effect of the word of God in the heart of man. So Psalm 19 in three parts. General revelation, what is the universe saying in a wordless sort of way, clearly proclaiming God's power? And then what is God's word like, his written word? And then what effect does that have in the heart, especially in the heart of one who believes? Now let's read Psalm 19, 1 to 4. The heavens are shouting the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out, or their sound has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. And you think, wait a second, is nature talking or not talking? (laughs) Yes, nature is communicating though without the articulation of words like the written word of God. But there is no doubt a clear message. Every human knows that God exists. 
the testimony of creation shouts his glory and the work of his hands? And what does the world do with this general revelation of God in nature? What do unbelievers do with this? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 1.18, they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Paul says in Romans 1, the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who, suppr who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is plain to them, for God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. And no one can claim ignorance about God's existence. And Paul goes on in Romans 2, no one can complain about ignorance, about morality in the human heart. Every human being has a capacity for right and wrong. We mislabel those things, but the very fact that we have a moral compass indicates that God has implanted certain things in the human heart. Knowledge that he exists, knowledge that there's right and wrong, and knowledge that people are accountable for doing wrong. Every human being who's ever lived knows these things. So what is Paul doing in Romans 10 with Psalm 19.4? I don't believe here that Paul is interpreting it for us as if Psalm 19.4 means Israel's culpable for their unbelief in Messiah. That's how Paul's using it, but he's not telling us that that's what Psalm 19 intended. Do you understand the difference? Paul is using an analogy from Psalm 19, its universality and the culpability of disbelieving it to describe the relationship that Israel has to special revelation, and specifically God's word about Christ. That is the context that Paul is setting up in Romans 10. He's making an analogy. As general revelation, what God declares in nature makes the world accountable to the knowledge of God that has been everywhere declared. So the special revelation of God through his word makes the Jews specially culpable in their unbelief and rejection of Messiah. God's wrath is revealed against those who suppress natural revelation. What will his attitude be toward those who hear the gospel and refuse it? Paul takes David's words about the universal reach of creation's message about God and applies them to the reach of God's word to his people Israel. Paul is saying, just as every human has heard creation's song about the creator and they have no excuse for their unbelief and idolatry, they're morally culpable before God. So the Jews have heard God's special song about Messiah and they are morally culpable for their unbelief and idolatry. Paul uses Psalm 19's language to assert the obstinacy and guilt of Jewish unbelief. Psalm 19 of Romans 1, God made it plain to every human that he exists. There is right and wrong, and we're all accountable for our actions, and we bury the truth as if we put it in a hole in the ground and cover the lid, close the lid. Similarly, God has made plain to Israel that he would send Messiah who would suffer and reign, who would be a light to the Gentiles and salvation to the Jews. That Messiah was the truth, and they buried the truth. They put him in the ground and closed the lid. Thankfully, the lid did not stay. This allusion to Psalm 19 may intend more than merely the verse 4 reference it is perhaps freighted with the message of the whole psalm, uh, the general revelation in 1 to 6, the special revelation or the written word of God in 7 to 9, and the work of the word in the heart of those who love God and believe him in 10 to 14. If Paul has in mind that his readers should pay attention to all of Psalm 19, then the audacity of Israel's unbelief is heightened further. Not only are they guilty of acting as practical atheists in terms of a revelation from God available to all people in every location at all times, but they are frightfully guilty of rejecting God's personal, gracious condescension in his word. The God of the universe made a special relationship to Israel. To refuse that kindness is more culpable. 
Go back to Romans 10, and we need to see how Paul frames this argument. In Romans 10, 4, we discover that Christ is the end of something. What does Christ put an end to? Law for righteousness, right? That idea that you can take a set of rules and make it the ground of your merit before God. I don't care what set of rules you use, it will never work. If you try to follow the Ten Commandments, you've already failed. If you try to follow the New Testament regulations, you've already failed. If you set up your own rules and your own standards, you can't keep those either. There is no law for righteousness, and belief in Christ puts an end to every attempt. And in verse 5, Jews in Paul's day assumed that law, God's law, Mosaic law, the good law, was there for them to prove their righteousness. That was their assumption. And it would only lead to destruction. And so Paul calls them in verses 6 to 10 to abandon self-rule and abandon self-justification and simply believe. Believe that Christ makes one right before God. And if you do that, verse 11, you will not be put to shame in the coming judgment. And in verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Everyone's on equal footing. Everyone's on equal footing as sinners before a holy God. And everyone's on equal footing in terms of their access to God through faith in Christ. And then verse 12, God abounds in riches for everyone who calls. Verse 13, whoever calls on Christ will be saved. Saved from your sin, saved from the consequences of your sin, saved from the coming judgment, saved from God himself. And in verses 14 to 17, God sends proclaimers. Proclaimers proclaim Christ to hearers. Hearers believe and they call on Christ and they are saved. But, verse 16, not everybody obeyed the good news. Why? Verse 18, Maybe they just didn't hear. And Paul emphatically denies this excuse and says of Israel, indeed they have. Paul in this context is not saying that indeed Israel has heard the voice of creation. Paul is specifically saying they have heard a word about Christ. Think about Israel's privileged position. Back in Romans 3, Paul brought this up, first two verses of Romans 3. What advantage has the Jew? Great in every respect. First of all, they were entrusted with the very oracles of God. In other words, God spoke. Not in the wordless proclamation of nature that just says somebody made this and it's incredible and I'm accountable and I'm a sinner. Not just that message. But the very special message of God's grace and his accessibility by faith. They were entrusted with these things. And down in chapter 9 of Romans, verses 4 and 5, they are the Israelites to whom belongs the adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, the promises. To Israel are the fathers, and from Israel is the Messiah, the Christ, according to the flesh, the Christ who is over all, the Christ who is God, blessed forever. What privileges Israel had. What did Israel have before them from their very inception? What were they able to read and access and rehearse? What was read in the synagogues week after week after week? In every place there was a population of Jews. Genesis 1 and 2, that Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the one who created the heavens and the earth. That he is the only God and he reigns over everything. And, and, and he made himself their God. They knew in Genesis 3.15 that a Messiah was promised, that somebody from the line of Eve would crush the head of the snake and reverse the curse. They knew from Genesis 6 to 9 that God hated sin and he was willing to destroy a mass of humanity in order to judge. They learn in Genesis 11 that God dispersed the nations for their disobedience and high-handed idolatry and rebellion. And they learn in Genesis 12 that God is gracious to idolaters who will believe. We learn that in, in the story of Abraham. Abraham, from the land of the Chaldeans, Babylonian idolatry, the, the seedbed of the Tower of Babel and the future Babylonian rebellion. That's where God calls Abram from. And Abraham was 
justified on the basis of faith. That is, God declared him righteous. He wasn't righteous. He was an idolater who didn't love God, didn't even know God, wasn't seeking for God. And God called him to himself, made him his own, and declared him righteous through faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Israel had all of this. And Israel had Isaiah 53. We looked at that last week. From Genesis to Malachi, Israel heard. Indeed, they have heard. The Old Testament witness to their own sin and their need of Messiah. The Old Testament witness to Messiah's work. The Jews in Paul's day, think about this, witnessed Messiah's appearance in time, space, and history. They saw him firsthand and they buried him. They also rejected the messengers of Messiah. Paul and the apostles were considered the dregs, the off-scouring, the scum of the earth. They were beaten, harassed, imprisoned, murdered. Listen, Jesus said it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon or for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Israel in the days of Messiah's visitation. They rejected their own Messiah. Think again about Paul's analogy from Psalm 19.4. Creation's voice has universal audience. And for Israel, a word about Christ had a universal audience. Wherever in the world there was a population of Jews, the Old Testament scriptures were present, the Old Testament scriptures were read, and by the time Romans, this letter was written, there was not a population of Jews in the inhabited world who had not heard the message of Messiah from the apostles and the followers of Jesus. The gospel had spread quickly through the Mediterranean world and had been preached to Israel. Well, maybe they just didn't understand. Now, Paul takes up this second excuse in verse 19. But I say, surely did not know, did they? By no here, Paul means a knowledge with understanding. Can it really be that Israel, the recipient of God's numerous and detailed prophecies about his plans and purposes, does not know, doesn't understand? Is that really possible? And Paul emphatically denies this excuse. And he spends the next three verses dismantling it with Old Testament texts. Paul wants to be clear about the kinds of things that Israel clearly understood from their own scriptures. And this is going to help us realize that Israel's problem was not that they didn't hear. Their problem was not that they didn't understand, but that they willfully rejected what they heard and understood. They willfully rejected good news. And what understanding does Paul want to highlight here from the Old Testament? This is A, B, and C in your outline, sort of subpoints. First of all, letter A, they understood God's employment of Gentiles to provoke them. What is the first thing Paul wants to highlight that Israel actually did understand? That God would use Gentiles to provoke them. And, and Paul quotes Deuteronomy 32, 21. He introduces it this way. First, Moses says. And by saying first, he means that Moses is the first in a long line of messengers whose message was rejected in unbelief by the nation of Israel. So you need to turn to Deuteronomy 32. Again, you just, you feel from this apostle whose job it was commissioned by Jesus to preach the gospel to Gentiles. <laughs> you feel his love for his country, for his nation. He keeps quoting the Old Testament scriptures. Again, four times in the span of four verses here at the end of Romans 10. And this time from Deuteronomy 32. This is a quote from the Song of Moses. This is Moses' sort of last words to Israel. He's just been told in Deuteronomy 31, verse 16, that he's going to die. Moses doesn't get to enter the promised land with the people. He, you know, wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness because of Israel's disobedience and because of his own sin against God, he doesn't get to enter into the promised land. So he's about to die. And then look down at verse 19 of 31. Moses says to the people, therefore, write this song for yourselves and teach it to the sons of Israel. Put it on their lips so that this song may be a witness for me against the sons of Israel. <laughs> 
For when I bring them into the land, flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and are satisfied and become prosperous, then they will turn to other gods and serve them and spurn me and break my covenant. Now, what, is, what song is Moses writing? This is the song of God's message to Israel about what will happen, what Israel will do. Then it shall come about, verse 21, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify before them as a witness. It shall not be forgotten from the lips of their descendants. By the way, this song gets quoted in the New Testament over and over again. For I know their intent, which they are developing today, before I have brought them into the land which I swore. And then Joshua is, com- is commissioned, be strong and courageous. You shall bring the sons of Israel into the land. Verse 27 I know your rebellion and your stubbornness. Behold, while I'm still alive with you today, says Moses, you have been rebellious against Yahweh. How much more than after my death? And he says in verse 29, I know that after my death you will act corruptly and turn from the way which I've commanded you. Evil will befall you in the latter days, for you will do that which is evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger with the work of your hands. And then we get into the song Uh, You can read the Song of Moses in its entirety this afternoon. Um, We're not going to read it all right now. I've asked Josh to set this uh, to music, and we're going to sing it as our closing song today. Just kidding. We're not going to do that. (laughs) But I want to highlight just a couple of things. Let's look at the first six verses. Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak. And let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let the teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew. Verse three, for I proclaim the name of Yahweh. Ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. They have acted corruptly toward him. Verse six, do you thus repay Yahweh, O foolish and unwise people? Is not he your father who bought you? He has made you and established you. Do you hear the appeal? And look down at verse 21. They have made me jealous, says Yahweh, with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. This is what Paul quotes in Romans 10. Reminding Israel that God warned them that he would provoke them through his activities with Gentiles. They made God jealous with their love of not gods. And so God will make his people jealous by his action through not peoples. They angered God with their dumb idols. And so God will anger them with foolish nations. Listen to Romans 2.20. Paul there is indicting Israel for their attitude towards the Gentile nations. And God writes through Paul, if you bear the name Jew and you rely upon the law and boast in God, you know his will, you approve of the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of immature having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. The Jewish mindset was that they were in relationship to the Gentiles, teachers of the ignorant. The Gentiles were ignorant, foolish, outsiders. The Jews saw themselves as a light to the nations. They were the teacher. This is why it is so shocking when Jesus shows up in the temple at the festival of lights, when the temple is lit up by all of the fires lighting up the whole place nearly as daylight, and Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And he tells his own people, Israel, that they are blind men walking in darkness. This was shocking. This was offensive to the Jewish mindset. Now, how has the Song of Moses played out in Israel's history? Well, first of all, they were jealous, provoked by other nations' prosperity at Israel's expense. How often did the nations surrounding Israel have things or prosperity that they envied? 
Secondly, they were jealous, provoked by God's use of Gentile nations to judge and oppress Israel. The cycle of the judges, Babylonian and Assyrian captivity. In fact, the times of the Gentiles since the exile has been a provocation for Israel. And thirdly, they are jealous, provoked by Gentile inclusion in the gospel. And this is what Paul highlights in his own day. Listen to Jesus in John 12. Though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing him. And this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? So Jesus comes to the Jews and they reject him. They don't believe Paul and Barnabas in Acts 13 spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God to be spoken to you first, Israel, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. In Acts 13, 50, the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. Why? Why? Because they took the news of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, rejected by Israel, they took that news to the Gentiles. And so Israel persecuted them. In Acts 21, you have a similar scene. When the seven days were almost over, the Jews from Asia, upon seeing Paul in the temple, began to stir up the crowd and laid hands on him. And they were complaining that Paul was hanging out with Gentiles. In Acts 22, Paul quotes Jesus and says, Uh, Jesus tells Paul, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And the Jews listened to him up to that statement. And then they raised their voices and said, Acts 22, 22, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. Why a death sentence against Paul? Because he's preaching God's kindness through Israel's Messiah to us, to Gentiles. This was offensive. In Romans 11, verse 11, Paul says, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. And then Paul goes on to say that if my preaching to Gentiles makes Jews jealous so that they believe, I'm fulfilling my ministry. And now, in Paul's day and in our day, Gentile response to the grace of God through Israel's Messiah has surpassed Israel's response. Early days of the church, most believers were Jews. But by the end of the first century, and now certainly in our day, the overwhelming response to the gospel has been people foreign to the covenants God made with Israel. Did the Jews understand the gospel of Jesus the Messiah? Yes, yes, they understood well enough to reject it. You see, you can't say at the same time, well, I I, I don't really, I haven't heard, and reject the message. You you can't say at the same time, "I, I don't really understand the gospel, and at the same time refuse it, or murder those who bring the gospel to you. You see, the response proves a level of understanding. It's not that the Jews didn't understand. It's not that they hadn't heard. It's that for them, a crucified Messiah was a scandal. A Messiah that would suffer and die at the hands of the Roman Empire, like some petty criminal, was a scandal. They could not get their hearts around. Salvation by grace alone through faith alone was a scandal they couldn't throw their pride away for. The grace of God proclaimed to Gentiles was a scandal they could not uphold. See, the gospel is not hard to understand. The good news of how a sinner gets to heaven is not difficult. That I'm a sinner. I have offended a holy God with the things that I've said and the things that I've done and the things that I've thought and the motives which have driven those things. My, my desires are all wrong. My affections are for all the wrong things. I've been an idolater at heart. I've worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. I've really, frankly, worshiped myself. I've lived for me rather than the, for the glory of God. 
and all these things are, are an offense to God. And the gospel is simple in that when a sinner comes to the end of himself and realizes that he or she is the problem and turns in faith to the only one who can help, yes, the judge of all the earth who will judge sinners for their sins is the same one who laid aside his judge's robe and took the place of the guilty criminal and suffered and died to pay for the criminal's crimes so that the criminal goes free. Justice is met, the criminal goes free. And the criminal goes free not because he could make up for it or pay off his debts or pay for his crimes. You could never pay an infinite debt like that. But by simply believing that the judge of the earth himself took our crimes on himself and paid for them in full, the sinner is set free. Eternal life is granted as a gift. Any attempt at religion, any attempt at rule keeping, any attempt at meriting this destroys the whole thing. All of that's condemnable. To be saved, to go to heaven, you must simply believe. And that belief looks like surrender to God in faith. It's, it's not a difficult message to understand but it is hard to accept. It is hard to accept that I really am the problem, that, that I'm on a level playing field morally with all the scum of the earth that I could think of that are worse than me. No, I, that's me. That's hard to accept. It's hard to accept that all my good deeds aren't enough to make God smile at me. That's hard to accept. It's hard to admit that I, I need a savior that could only come about by God himself taking on flesh and going to a cross and paying for my sins. It's hard to accept that. Hard to admit that. It, it's hard to surrender my life to someone else's control so that I don't get to be God anymore. And it's hard to obey. Remember Romans 10, 16, they did not all obey the gospel. Tom Pennington has pointed out, the gospel is a message to be believed, an invitation to be accepted, and as Paul says here in Romans 10, a command to be obeyed. And it's not a difficult message to hear. It's not a difficult message to understand. It's just hard to believe. Impossible, really, in terms of our own resources, in terms of what I bring to the table. But Israel's failure to believe the gospel was not a matter of not hearing, nor of not understanding, but of willful rejection. They heard, they understood, and they refused the good news. Israel understood God's promise to provoke them through Gentile inclusion in his plans. Secondly, letter B in your outline, Israel understood their own history. Israel understood their own history, Romans 10, 20. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Now, this is a quote of Isaiah 65, 1, which says it this way. I permitted myself, says God, I permitted myself to be sought by those who didn't ask. I permitted myself to be found by those who didn't seek. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. And Isaiah 65, 1 is clearly talking about Israel, a singular nation that, that God permitted himself to be accessed by, to, to be known by, to be sought by. And he's indicting Israel for their rebellion and their idolatry in Isaiah 65. And virtually every commentator agrees that Isaiah, in context, is referring to Israel. But almost every commentator believes that Paul changes the meaning here in verse 20 of Romans 10 to refer to Gentiles. And I don't think that's at all what Paul is doing here. And some of the reasons people think that is in verse 21, uh, you see that, but as for Israel, he says. And it seems to be a hard contrast between verse 20 and verse 21. I was found by those who didn't seek me. I, was, I became manifest to those who didn't ask for me. But as for Israel. You need to know in the Greek text, that is not a hard contrast there. It is simply an and. 
These are parallel statements, and they come back to back. Uh, Romans 10.20 and Romans 10.21 are back to back quotes of Isaiah 65.1 and Isaiah 65.2. In other words, in two verses, he quotes two verses in their context, both of which are about Israel. And by the way, Romans 10, 19 through 21 are all grammatically connected under the first clause of verse 19. That is, I say, Israel did not know, did they? And then he goes on to describe what it is exactly Israel understood. They understood, number one, that God would use Gentiles to provoke them. They understood, number two, their own history. Now, what is Paul doing here with this quote? Paul is reminding Israel of the way Israel was formed in its beginning. He starts out by saying, Isaiah is very bold and says, what is Isaiah boldly saying here? Israel, you weren't looking for me. You weren't seeking me. Do you remember? Do you remember? Abraham, the, the Chaldean idolater, the Babylonian idolater was not looking for me. And I went and sought him out, introduced myself to him, made him my own, and made promises to him. And if you trace Israel's history, Israel throughout its history was undeserving of God's grace and God took the initiative at every step and his mercy was unrelentless or was relentless with them. And listen, there's a principle that applies here for every person, Jew and Gentile. Paul has laid it out in Romans 3, no one seeks for God. We have the idea sometimes that, that people are out there honestly, genuinely, just searching for the truth, seeking for God. That's not God's estimation of the human condition. Men have searched out everything other than the one true God because they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And if anyone is going to be found by God, if anyone is going to find God, that one will be sought by God. Jesus said this in John 4, God is the one who seeks worshipers. And this is true for Jews and Gentiles, that God permits himself to be found by those not looking for him that God permits himself to be discovered by those not seeking. That's true for everyone here this morning. And what, is, what else did Israel understand? Number one, Israel understood that God would provoke them through Gentiles. Number two, Israel understood their own history. They, they knew the Old Testament. They knew that they weren't seeking God first, but he made them a nation by his grace Finally, let her see, they understood God's relentless, merciful invitation. God's relentless, merciful invitation. Look at the second quote from Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, 2 is quoted here in Romans 10, 21. As for Israel, he says, all the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Two things are on display in this verse. God's relentless mercy, Israel's obstinate unbelief. What a depiction here. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. Isaiah 65, 2 goes on. Who walk in the way which is not good, following their own thoughts. Listen, the sinful creature should be stretching out his filthy hands from his hopeless state to his offended creator, crying out for help. And the God of heaven and earth instead portrays himself holding out his hands in gracious invitation to the sinner who has offended him. Listen, do people do that? You get offended by somebody in this world? Is your natural inclination to say, oh, I just want to love you? I just want to welcome you into my life. And, and have you associate yourself with me. And I'm going to associate myself with you. Is that what we do naturally? This is in the very nature of God. To hold his hands out a long time to obstinate, rebellious people. This is the prodigal's father. Remember the son who ran away from dad in Jesus' parable? Spends all the inheritance on all kinds of garbage, gets to the bottom, comes back. What is the father's response to such a one? 
he runs. He runs and embraces the son. Why? This is in the very heart of God, the very nature of God, to hold out his hands in gracious invitation to the sinner who will turn, to the one who recognizes he needs a savior and will turn in faith to the only hope, God himself. Israel knew this about God. Listen to Isaiah 1, verses 2 to 5. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for Yahweh speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? In other words, what else is it gonna take to get your attention, Israel? Look at verse 18 of the same chapter. God says, so graciously, come now. Let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be white as white wool. What a gracious God. Isaiah 55 has another of God's gracious invitations. I really think this first three verses of Isaiah 55 sums up the theme of the Bible. What is the Bible about? (laughs) Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Why do you spend all of your resources, humanity, on stuff that will only kill you? You think it will bring you happiness and everything you try fails and you try something else and it fails and you might be trying something else right now and trust me, it will fail to satisfy. And God says, come, Take from me freely what I give that is of infant value. Listen carefully to me, he says, and eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. What a gracious invitation from God. In Isaiah 64, 6, the indictment against Israel was they were all unclean. All their righteous deeds are like a filthy garment In other words, the the best they had to offer was garbage before God. The sinner who comes to Jesus Christ by faith recognizes this. The best I have to offer, offer is an offense to God. I need something outside of myself. And it is to these rebellious people that God speaks in Isaiah 65. Very next chapter. I permitted myself to be sought by those who didn't seek me to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation which did not call out my name. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people. Consider this as we're thinking about Israel's response to God's gracious invitation. Think about it in terms of God's gracious invitation to Gentiles. Remember Jonah's ministry? Most of the prophets writing prophets in the Old Testament uh, seem to want to say what God wanted them to say to the audience they were supposed to say it. Uh, sometimes those messages were hard and difficult and they cost the prophet a lot, but Jonah ran the other way. He did not want to give God's message to the Ninevites. Why? That, Jonah's heart is revealed for us in Jonah 3.10 and following. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, Then God relented concerning the calamity which he declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. God had said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh for its sin. Jonah, go tell them that. Jonah told them, they repented, God relented, and they lived. (laughs) But it greatly displeased Jonah, chapter 4, verse 1, and Jonah became angry. What? What? This is the most successful preaching engagement in the history of mankind. 
and Jonah was angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was not this what I said was I, while I was still in my own country? Didn't I tell you that they would believe, <laughs> that you would be kind to them? It's not fair. Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Jonah knew something about the heart of God and his disposition towards sinners who will repent, enough to know that God might even be gracious to Ninevites. And he didn't like it. What would Jonah think about what's happening today? Well, I think he likes it now. Israel's failure to believe Messiah is not a failure to hear, not a failure to understand God and his ways, but it is an obstinate refusal to believe and obey. Let's turn the corner just a little bit. You've been off the hook this morning thinking about Israel. <laughs> Let's just think about us for a little bit. You cannot claim to have not heard. You've heard. You heard Scott preach the gospel this morning as we prepared for the Lord's table and communion. You've heard the gospel in the songs we've sung. You've heard the gospel in this very message and you cannot claim to not understand. God has made the gospel so that all who hear it could understand it. It's not a complicated message. It's not a bunch of hard things you have to do in, in the limited amount of time you have to do it. It is simply believe in God's provision for sinners through his son, Jesus Christ. You will not be able to claim ignorance when you meet God face to face. You see, a failure to believe the gospel is a matter of culpable disobedience when it is heard. And think about what it is you would be disobeying. Good news. You've won the lottery. Come get the check. You'd be refusing, disobeying life as a free gift. Citizenship in heaven, adoption into God's family with all of its privileges, freedom from slavery, canceled debt, forgiveness of sin, the conquering of death, and best of all, God himself, access to him. If you've not believed, you might be tempted to think of yourself as indifferent. Oh, I, it's not a big deal, I just don't believe. I'm just, I'm just not there, I'm just not a believer. You need to understand that that is unbelief. It is the very thing that Israel is indicted for in this very passage, and it is the very thing you will be accountable for when you meet God. By the way, you know that he exists, and you've heard the offer of his free gift of salvation in Christ. You might believe this morning that you're simply procrastinating. I'll get around to that later. That is unbelief indicted in this passage the truth is it remains obstinate rebellion. Look to the God who with outstretched arms offers himself to those who have lived in obstinate rebellion. Look to him and see a father who loves and longs to pour out his love on sinners who will turn. Will you turn to him today and find everything? Let's pray. God, you have indeed stretched out your hands a long time. For thousands of years to humans like us, creatures created in your image who have rebelled against what we were supposed to be, who have rebelled against you, who have thanklessly enjoyed your gifts on this created earth and have not given you praise for them. We have worshiped and served created things rather than you. And we have loved ourselves. Oh God, would you pour out your love, your indescribable, infinite love on us this morning. Would there be some even here this morning who are hearing the gospel, understanding the gospel, who would not remain in unbelief but would be melted by your love?
brought low by your compassion and exalted by your grace simultaneously. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name.